Hello, I'm Ted Gunderson. I retired from the FBI in 1979 after more than 27 years service. At the time of my retirement, I was a senior special agent in charge of the FBI Los Angeles Division with more than 700 people under my command and a budget of more than $22.5 million. I recently decided to produce my own radio talk show. One of my guests was Gene Chip Tatum, a former CIA 25-year black ops operator. At the end of the first show of two hours, I decided this man had much more information to furnish than he could furnish in that two-hour period. I had him back for 13 more shows. I interviewed him for a total of 26 hours. This man has a phenomenal story. I've checked his story out. I can definitely state to you this man is credible and the information he's furnishing is the truth. Listen and watch. You will be amazed at what you hear. Hi, my name is Chip Tatum and I'm an ex-intelligence officer for the United States government. 25 years ago I started my service as a young airman in the United States Air Force. I went through special forces training as a combat controller and was subsequently sent to Vietnam. During my tour in Vietnam, I was recruited onto a team called Team Red Rock. The operation that we performed was Operation Red Rock. It was an operation designed to move Lan Nol, the premier of Cambodia, off of the proverbial fence and onto the side of the U.S. government. During this operation, Team Red Rock was captured. Uh, orders were given by the President of the United States that Team Red Rock should not return to the United States. During our captivity, all but two of us were tortured to death. Following Operation Red Rock, I was debriefed by a man out of Saigon. This man came to Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines where I was being held uh, as a patient and uh, debriefed me. During the debriefing, he explained to me what happened while we were in captivity and explained the events leading up to the captivity. Uh, he explained to me that when Washington decided, when Washington decided to uh, order Operation Red Rock, the President ordered that no one can ever know. With those orders to General Haig and to Dr. Henry Kissinger, uh, the mission was given to Bill Colby, the station chief in Saigon, to prepare the mission and to ensure that the men performing the mission didn't return. At the end of the debriefing with Mr. Colby, he explained to me that I had a choice. I could either stay with the Air Force and go under the operational control of the CIA, or I could go under the direct employment of the CIA. I chose as a young military man to stay with what I knew. I enjoyed the Air Force, I enjoyed the camaraderie in the military, and I knew for sure that I wouldn't have to go back to Vietnam as an ex-prisoner of war. Well, I chose that route, and no sooner did I get back to the United States than I was turned around and sent back to the Southeast area, Southeast Asia area again. Uh, I moved in and out of Vietnam uh, under the operational control of the CIA attached to a company called Air America. My job was to jump into the area of downed Air American aircraft and communicate uh, to move them out and extract them from the area. In 1975, my operational control mission sent me to a place called Yugoslavia. I actually based out of Italy, but we crossed the border into Yugoslavia to try to ascertain the condition of Tito and uh, the condition of the country. Uh, to try to find out who was going to be replacing Tito in the event of his death. Uh, President Tito was very ill. I spent uh, two years in, in that uh, area of operations and then upon Mr. Colby's advice I left active service for the United States government. When I left service I went, in, went into a place called Gunnison, Colorado. I started my family. I had a little deli. I was working in the deli one day and a couple of the boys came in wearing suits and sunglasses. Uh, they told me that the government needed me and I was reactivated involuntarily uh, to the United States Army this time. I was sent to a place called Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Fort Campbell uh, was basing a new special operations unit uh, 
the buildup of this unit was in response to our problem in the Iranian desert in the failed hostage rescue unit under the Carter administration. The year was 1980. Uh, the activation of me into this unit uh, brought on an all new meaning uh, to me in the area of intelligence work. Previous to this time, although Team Red Rock was betrayed by the president in his orders that we shouldn't return, uh, I found no other involvement uh, of the government in misdeeds. However, from the day I joined Task Force 160 at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, until today, I've seen nothing but government corruption. He said, uh, pending before this court, and I won't bore you with the first language. By the way, copies of this are available over in our, in our booth, booth 228. Um, pending before this court is the defendant's motion, blah, blah, blah. It says, uh, he even goes on to say that he believes we probably can prove all this evidence. But here's what he says we cannot talk about. Any reference to the plaintiffs, that's me, Plaintiff's participation in programs, operations, or missions sponsored by the FBI or the CIA or any other agency of the United States government, covert or otherwise, as well as any organization sponsored by or aligned with the U.S. government, specifically including but not limited to any programs, operations, or missions conducted in southwest Arkansas regarding the training of Nicaraguan nationals the funding and support for any functions involved in the Nicaraguan conflict, and any contact or communications with operatives, officials of the above named agencies or organizations. Any reference to President or Governor Bill Clinton and or Hillary Clinton and the Mina Ornella airports. Any references to Barry Seal and any alleged drug smuggling operation or other references to the Mina Ornella airports or to a business relationship of Barry Seal and Dan Lassiter, Lassiter and Company, and the Arkansas Development and Finance Authority, parenthesis ADFA, A-D-F-A, and ADFA's former director, Bob Nash. It is so ordered this eighth day of March, 1996. That was our lawsuit. And, uh, and out the window it went, which, uh, as I said in my letters, I filed it back to the court, what I found most interesting was this, this motion went beyond our lawsuit. And nowhere in our suit had we even named some of the people they eliminated reference to, which obviously was their own admission that they knew exactly where their liabilities were and wanted to make sure that we didn't get into court and somehow bring in the real scandal of this story, which is the money laundering aspects of what was going on with the huge profits generated from the cocaine activity. Many of you will wonder why I've decided to come forward today and how I can come forward as an ex-officer uh, for the CIA, for the DIA, or NSC. Uh, and let me explain that to you. I can come forward today because a federal judge has ordered at a federal trial that I was a uh, defendant in that the items that I wanted to discuss and present in my trial were not classified. And the reason he decided to do that is the last thing that that judge wanted to do was allow that courtroom to hear what I had to say. Uh, he had to, first of all, under the SEPA uh, requirements, that's Classified Information Procedures Act of federal court, he would have to get security clearances for all of the jurors, for the U.S. attorney and for my attorney, and all of the clerks in the courtroom. And, he, and no, ju judges, although the judges aren't allowed, aren't required to have that clearance, um, he would have had to have his staff cleared. The clearances presented a problem in that it would, would have delayed the trial several months and they would have had to allow me bond of some sort at that point. Uh, at that point I had been held without bond because I was a flight risk and a danger to society. Uh, the statement made by the Federal Bureau of Investigation after arresting me was that I had uh, traveled outside of the country um, well, of course I had. <laughs> that was my job. Uh, so that made me a flight risk. Uh, even though my family lived here, I was still a flight risk. So I was held in prison. Uh, they can do that. They can do that for an un undetermined amount of time in any federal case uh, in the interest of justice. Uh, they can delay 
your speedy trial acts in the interest of justice and because the courts are backed up. So uh, everyone needs to understand that the federal court system is, the, is a very one-sided system. Uh, it's interesting that uh, during, uh, during testimony by federal agents uh, in the pretrial portion, in the bond portion, a uh, federal agent is allowed to lie on the stand and won't be held accountable for that lie. They won't be prosecuted because it's very difficult for the U.S. Attorney's Office to prosecute their uh, purported prime, uh, prime persons that will provide testimony during the, during the body of the trial. But, you know, here's an interesting thing. If the if, and I'm only using if for the benefit of those who are uninformed about what's going on. If the CIA has actually been involved in, involved in uh, smuggling drugs into the United States, as I know for the last 45 years they've been doing, uh, how do you keep all these people quiet? Because it takes a lot of people. Well, the way we keep them quiet is uh, working with the Justice Department and anybody that threatens to expose any of this, we simply charge them with offense. Either we fabricate the charges or simply charge them for doing what we ordered them to do. And um, they end up in federal prison. Uh, usually federal judges will cooperate, uh, as, I, uh, as I describe in my books, where federal judges will not let them bring in any of the CIA witnesses or won't let them produce the CIA, uh, the documents showing that they were CIA, and they end up in, in prison. And this, I mean, there's hundreds of people that this has happened to. So what I want to do now is I want to talk about an ultra-secret task force, one that was presented to the judge, and the judge said, it's not classified, it's not of national security, but it's irrelevant to this, so you can't take the stand in your own defense using any of this. So that allows me to talk to you today without prosecution. Task Force 160 was formed following the debacle in the desert, uh, the problems that we had in trying to rescue the hostages in our Iran were, were compounded by the fact that the wrong aircraft were chosen uh, by our Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, you have to understand that even in the military, when you get to the level of a Joint Chief, the Joint Chiefs, it's a very political position, and everyone's jockeying to have their own aircraft or their own personnel involved in something that they feel is a, a slam dunk rescue effort. Unfortunately, because of politics, uh, many young American soldiers lost their lives in the desert in Iran. We were, when President Bush came into office, or when, I'm sorry, when President Reagan came into office, it's hard to differentiate between the two in that administration. Uh, when President Reagan came into office, he decided he didn't want anything like this to happen to him. He knew that the anti-terrorist threat was there and that something would have to be done. So it was decided that they would prepare a task force of aviation assets. These aviation assets were trained and based out of Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Uh, nicknamed the Night Stalkers because our primary function was to fly night vision goggle flight. Uh, night vision goggles or night vision equipment uh, that are hooked to the aviation flight helmets. Uh, and we fly in the cover of darkness. Uh, the goggles are great except they have no depth perception. And the stress factor flying under, under goggles is four to five times that of normal flight, even normal night flight. We would routinely fly cross country uh, across the United States. We had uh, the availability uh, in later years of air to air refueling. We had the availability of uh, uh, bladders, tactical bladders on board to extend our flight day and our uh, flight range. So we would routinely fly cross country. Some of the bases that we stopped at, because we were a very top secret organization as Task Force 160 at the time, and Task Force 160, you know, today is the black helicopters flying around the country. Uh, some of the, uh, because of the missions that we flew, it was difficult for us to, no to land in the normal military environment. Uh, there are bases set up across the United States uh, with minimum skeleton crews uh, to support, that was, were able to support us for what we call RONs, rest overnights, uh, as we ended our crew day. Uh, these bases are high security bases. Uh, one of them in particular in the, in the desert in Nevada that I noticed uh, was set up to handle over 2,000 people. 
Uh, it was a high security imprisonment containment area. I know that uh, flying from base to, pay, to base to base in the United States, many of the Army bases have received orders to set up containment areas uh, for some type of prisoners, for some type of activity. Uh, what that is, I don't know, but I can tell you that they're being built and they exist, and they're being built under, under existing Department of Defense monies. I have a copy of a, of a letter here that, that ordered the Army and I'll, I'll give some of you their leaders a copy, and you can make copies. I've passed out tens of thousands of these across America. But it, the head, heading is, and the seal up there and all, is the head, Department of the Army, Headquarters, United States Army, Training and Doctrine Command. Now, I'm not supposed to have this letter, but it's not illegal for me to have it because it's not classified. I've added five lines at the bottom about the concentration camps because that's what it really is. There were about 43 of these detention centers, as they were called. And you know, uh, some six months ago, they started stocking food in warehouses for the people they were going to put in them. But in the last few months, they've increased to over 130. And many of them are on military active installations and on what was former some of the 96 closed military installations that were supposed to be returned to the citizens as real estate and so forth. Now, they've already stockpiled food for the people they're going to put in there. And then this letter says, uh, the subject of it, and the date of it is July uh, 1994, and they're supposed to come up with the guidance on how to set up these camps not later than two months later, the 29th of August, 1994. So we have to hold the commander in chief who's now in office responsible for this because no four star general at that headquarters would issue a letter like this unless he'd been ordered to. Do you understand that? Uh, he'd be, uh, you know, subject court martial. The high security bases are closed bases. Some bases aren't. Some bases have uh, highways that you can drive right through. However, when you look at this area, you'll, you'll just think, hey, look at the barbed wire around that place. I wonder what's in there. Well, not much is in there right now, but something will be in there. Uh, and it will be people. It won't be equipment. It's, they're not designed to hold a lot of equipment. They're designed to hold a lot of people. They're not warehouse areas. Primary, the primary mission of Task Force 160 was to support uh, anti the anti-terrorism uh, units uh, such as Delta Force, the uh, FBI Special Operation Group. Uh, we, we would provide aviation assets for, for those assets. On the military side, we would provide aviation assets for special operations for the SEALs and so forth. Uh, however, uh, direct orders and direct um, uh, functions were controlled by uh, the National Security Council. Uh, we didn't fall under the TONE, which is uh, the equipment. We weren't tasked um, as members of the military. We were a separate, separate entity altogether. Didn't exist in the military. As a matter of fact, during the uh, Grenada invasion, there's a picture of me from a Louisville newspaper standing on a beach in Grenada with my Hughes 500 uh, with about 70 bullet holes, entry holes into it. Uh, I'd sustained two broken ribs during the attack uh, and nothing you will ever find will show that type of aircraft as being one of the aircraft on that invasion yet there's a picture of me not being there <laughs> on, on the front of the newspaper the particular reporter Jim Malone uh, who's been trying to trace this and get the Air Force or the Army to own up to it the Army still contends uh, that 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 doesn't exist uh, that didn't happen. Uh, yet he, he's the man who was standing there talking to me on the beach at the beachhead in Grenada. Currently, uh, I'll, I'll talk in, in current events on the 160th. Currently they have uh, Blackhawks um, and attack aircraft, uh, two separate types of attack aircraft, and they have large cargo aircraft. The attack aircraft uh, are the uh, MD instead of Hughes. Uh, McDonnell Douglas bought out the Hughes Corporation. Um, they're called the MD Defenders, which is a Hughes 500 beefed up. Uh, it's uh, a utility model uh, and it's an attack model, two separate models, uh, each, each uh, very dangerous in their own rights. Uh, the Blackhawks are um, 
utility aircraft, and, but they can carry armament and have uh, long range capabilities. And we have the Chinook aircraft, the Super Chinooks we call them, which uh, are large troop and uh, equipment carriers. Uh, all of them are very, very dark in color and the uh, matching uh, paint uh, identifies who they are, very, very dark in color. However, a very, very blackish green uh, would look, it would probably look black to the naked eye until you got right up next to it and you would have to feel the tail of the aircraft to feel that what name is on there is the United States Army. It is U.S. Army. Uh, however, uh, in earlier years, uh, the assets were controlled, like I said, by the National Security Council. Uh, our particular unit in the Little Birds, many of us were, were, were uh, officers from the Central Intelligence Agency or agents from the Central Intelligence Agency. Let me explain to you the difference. An agent is a contract person. An officer is a card-carrying person from the agency. And you were? I was an officer and an agent. Uh, on separate occasions, whatever the need need was, I, I would be sheep dipped out and into a different entity to work as a contract, off, contract agent. As a matter of record, I was, yes. Um, at our SEPA briefing, that wasn't, uh, the government didn't uh, uh, contest that uh, because they know it's a matter of record. Who I am and what I am now is a matter of, pedi uh, of uh, public record. Uh, what I have to say may be highly contested and should be highly contested about uh, those in power because what I have to say about them is, is not a compliment. I believe I was paid for 22 years to work for the American people. I believe that you have the right as, as Americans in this country, as taxpayers, to know what happened. What you do with this information is completely up to you. Uh, how you deal with it is completely up to you. Uh, whether you believe me is completely up to you. But I will tell you this, what you do with it will have an effect on you the rest of your life. If you choose to ignore, the, ignore what I have to say, in time to come, you'll see that probably you should not have completely ignored what I had to say. Uh, and that's just my own opinion. Uh, but it's an opinion of an of a intelligence officer who's been out there who's been battling in the field for the right for you to call me a liar. I think that's, this is a wonderful country when it's a country that you have the right to your own opinion. There aren't many countries out there where you can have the right to your own opinion. And I think that we need to continue uh, to protect our rights to have that opinion. Well, with the conspiracy laws, all you have to do is say something wrong to another person. Uh, and you, you've lost that right, you're then a felon. I'm a felon. I left federal prison April 4th of this year. And what I'd like to do now is tell you what happened to me, how it happened to me, so that maybe you can learn from it and avoid some of the pitfalls. In 1985, I was tasked with infiltrating a unit at Fort Stewart, Georgia. The unit was a medevac unit. In the military, their uh, taskings are made far in advance on who's going to support certain activities. The Nicaraguan Revolution was well underway. Uh, the Boland Act was in place, and the Boland Act uh, did not allow for U.S. elements to support the uh, revolution in Nicaragua. Uh, the only way that the United States government could support those were in uh, humanitarian efforts. So as a medevac helicopter pilot, uh, I would be able to support whatever the intelligence needs were posing as that medevac helicopter pilot. So I was tasked to infiltrate the third of the 498th Med Company in Fort Stewart, Georgia, who would soon be getting a tasking to go to Honduras. I soon found myself in a place called Pomerola, Honduras with a U.S. Army crew. Uh, I was the only uh, intelligence officer on that crew. Uh, the crew consisted of uh, two aircraft and two crews. Uh, I was the executive officer of that. Uh, we had a, uh, a ranking uh, military officer with us who was actually the officer in charge of the contingency. Um, on February 26th, I was flying uh, two pilots from Ilopango Air Base uh, into the Contra camps. Uh, one of them in particular was El Paraiso. Uh, they were to arrange arms drops 
being done by a third entity, a company called Corporate Air Services. Uh, this Corporate Air Services uh, employed several pilots from the old days uh, who were somehow attached to ex-intelligence agencies. Uh, some of them were even old Air America pilots. So uh, you can imagine who might be the actual owner of Corporate Air Services. Uh, this was the group uh, and part of the group uh, that was owned by Ollie North's Enterprise. Um, you would find in 1986 these two pilots that I flew uh, on February 26, 1985 were killed in a plane crash over Nicaragua. Eugene Hossenfoss survived that crash and was subsequently captured by the Nicaraguan government and sent back to the United States. On that day in February 26, 1985, uh, after picking up uh, Mr. Cooper and Mr. Sawyer, the pilots, from their meeting in El Pariso, uh, they came out of the meeting and they had uh, a cooler marked vaccine. The cooler was a large uh, cooler, uh, probably about a 96 or 100 quart size, if you understand uh, the sizes of coolers, very large, commercial grade. Uh, it was sealed and it was marked vaccine. We put it on board the aircraft. We flew all of them to La Mesa, Honduras. Uh, the two pilots were scheduled to catch a flight back to El Salvador. Uh, the cooler was destined for Panama to a Dr. Harari. Uh, I, was, I was given instructions to pass it on to a Air, U.S. Air Force C-130 that was uh, landing there sometime within the next few hours. Uh, when we unloaded the cooler from the aircraft, it, the seal broke on it. Uh, it popped open. Uh, I think that probably the hard landing that I had uh, and bounced it around inside the aircraft on that particular occasion on a very hot day uh, helped aid in breaking that seal. Um, but when the seal broke, we found uh, a large quantity of bricks wrapped in a blue medical tape. Uh, we opened it up. I put my finger across the powdery substance, crystalline type powder, put it on my tongue and it immediately numbed my tongue. Uh, previous experience told me that this was cocaine. Uh, and estimating the amount of cocaine in, on, inside that cooler, it was over 100 kilos of cocaine. I asked the pilot who it was going to, and he said in, in uh, Honduras, or in, in Panama, it was going to a man called Dr. Harari. Uh, Dr. Harari, I would find out later, was actually Mike Harari, a Mossad agent assigned to General Manuel Noriega as a confidant. <clears throat> Upon arriving back at Pomerola Air Base, I immediately went into our secure lines. I called Washington Switch, and I advised them, uh, the, my controller at Washington Switch, uh, what I had found. My controller, uh, a man codenamed Jake that I'd met in earlier years in Task Force 160, was actually Ollie, Ollie North. Uh, Mr. North told me that um, it was evidence that the Sandinistas were dealing in cocaine. The Contras had confiscated it during a battle from the Sandinista government, and it was destined for world courts, for the warehouses and to be used as evidence in world courts against the Sandinista government. Uh, during my time in Honduras, probably eight tons of uh, medical supplies in a light powder and a crystalline, two different substances, were flown by my medical aircraft. Uh, always marked medical supplies of some sort and normally delivered to waiting C-130s or uh, civilian C-123s or DC-3s in the area of operations. On one particular occasion following my initial find, uh, I had an engine failure. During the auto rotation process, the blades on my aircraft had been put into a negative pitch position so that it would not auto rotate correctly. Uh, after landing and having the maintenance officer look at the aircraft, uh, we did survive the landing. Uh, it did damage the aircraft. Uh, but Mr. Cooper, our maintenance officer, looked at it and said, it's amazing that you guys survived. These blades are completely negative pitch. They should never have uh, rotated on their own. They should have gone into a counter rotation and dropped you out of the sky like a dipsy dumpster. Fortunately, uh, having aviation skills that I have, and that's what I do for a living. I can fly an aircraft under any radar anywhere. That's my forte. 
that's why I was, I was chosen for this, and that's how I was chosen to be used in the intelligence community uh, throughout my career. Having survived that, we knew that there were some problems. So on the back of our flight plans, I would normally try to cover ourselves and uh, provide insurance for what was going on. Uh, my passengers were written on the back of the flight plan after I landed. The cargo that we found on board the aircraft were written on the back of the flight plans uh, after I landed. And anything having to do with the mission that was of interest were written on the back of the flight plans after I landed. This was all done at base operations where the flight plans were filed at Pomerola Air Base in Honduras. During this three-month period, we, we collected a number of documents uh, in both flight plans, mission briefs, and uh, mission uh, uh, air, air evac uh, medical reports uh, that we made these notes on. Um, it's interesting that they aren't just my notes. I did have crew members who can corroborate most of what I have to say. Uh, they remember the instance as well. We, we developed a, an insurance policy in that manner, uh, and in later years I found that I would have to develop even a greater insurance policy. Uh, the people I worked for, the people I flew, uh, are all on these flight plans uh, for this three to four month period. Uh, they were filed with base operations, and uh, a very trusted Honduran government official kept those in, in uh, his chain of custody so that they were protected through the years. Uh, in 1995, I went back to Honduras and I collected these documents uh, after a threat from Ali North to give up the documents or else. I knew that to give him the documents wasn't going to work. Uh, <laughs> I knew where I'd end up if I gave him the documents. So in lieu of that, I went back to Honduras. I took my wife. Uh, we flew into Honduras. We were followed. Uh, when we landed in Belize first, uh, I, I knew that we were being followed at that point. Uh, I was able to... Um, evade the person who was assigned to follow us so that I could meet with the person who had these documents. He gave me certified copies of the documents and we returned to the U.S. Within two weeks of returning to the United States, I was arrested by the FBI uh, and placed in prison. But let me tell you even a little more about the instances that followed my arrest. In 1995, I was arrested by the FBI within two weeks of returning to the United States from Honduras. While in Honduras, I picked up certified copies of the documents, which I told you about earlier, and I'll, I'll show you copies of in just a moment. While I was being held in a federal facility, federal officers came into me and told me, give up the documents, Tatum. Give them up or else you'll be charged with treason. And if you don't go to prison for the rest of your life, you may even be executed. In lieu of giving those documents up, I decided to do something else. I published those documents and I sent a copy to the White House. This is a Department of Defense International flight plan filed by myself and my co-pilot. The names in this section, Robert Brantner, our crew chief was a Mr. Rodriguez and our medic was Gary Watkins. This flight plan was filed with base operations on February 26, 1985. The aircraft call sign was dust off 713. The actual number of the aircraft is also indicated on the flight plan. It shows that we flew a military mission in aircraft 7015713. We refueled at La Mesa. It shows that the people we flew as passengers were sent from Wally World, which was the intelligence compound at Pomerola Air Base. The names of the passengers were Cooper and Sawyer. Now if you'll recall from a few moments ago I told you about the cargo we flew. On the opposite side of this flight plan we have the cargoes. As you can see we were destined to transport vaccine to La Mesa. There was no one there to pick up the vaccine for one hour and 45 minutes. The note placed on the, by me states that the vaccine popped open on landing while powdery substance, or a white powdery substance, advised Rodriguez via Lima Lima suspected cocaine container was large white cooler 
similar to the ones I delivered to Arkansas in 1984. The stamp on it is Copia Certificata, which is a certified copy provided by the Honduran government. This particular government official has the originals in hand and is willing to produce the originals to any world court that is willing to prosecute those who are trafficking in cocaine in their country. This is a flight plan dated 18 March 1985. We flew aircraft 429, which was actually uh, 4016429. Uh, I was a pilot. My co-pilot was Scott Williams, uh, who many of you may recognize as a, as a CIA asset. Uh, my crew chief was Bill McDonald, and again, my crew chief was Rod E4 Rodriguez. This particular flight, we flew into several villages and then into San Lorenzo, Honduras. Uh, the personnel on board the aircraft uh, were two, a uh, Mr. North, who you know as Oliver North, and another passenger. The particular mission that we flew on this day required us to go into a area that was heavily shelled during the night. It was a Contra village. Uh, at the Contra village, we picked up a patient who had trauma to the leg, uh, massive rib fracture, and the second pa patient uh, had upper chest wounds. Uh, as the medic was uh, treating the chest wound, uh, he needed my help. I went over and helped him. Mr. North, who had arrived late at the aircraft that morning, making us 45 minutes for our, for our takeoff, uh, came over, exasperated that we were taking such a large amount of time working on these Honduran nationals, or on these, uh, I should say, Contras. Um, but they were Hondurans. They weren't uh, Nicaraguans, so that you know. Uh, Mr. North had decided uh, that we were taking too much time. He came over and told us to get the aircraft up and going. Uh, however, when he got to us, he looked at the chest wound. The chest wound was a gaping chest wound. The heart was exposed and it was beating. Mr. North fainted. It compounded the medic's duties in having to uh, tend to old blood and guts Oliver North. Uh, he made the notes on, on this, his uh, medical evaluation. Uh, medics, additional medics' comments are on the reverse of this particular flight plan. Sure, the comments say approximate ground time 15 minutes. Do, this was in delivering, uh, in San Lorenzo, delivering the patients. Uh, 15 minutes is a large amount of time when you have chest wounds and so forth to offload the ambulances to take to the primary care facility, to the, to the tactical facility that was set up. Uh, and the medic was complaining here because it took so much time to get the people offloaded and in, into uh, trauma care. On the 16th of March, I was tasked to fly two individuals from Tegucigalpa on a sightseeing mission around Honduras over the camps and back into Pomerola Air Base. Uh, we were flying an aircraft 228, which is actually aircraft tail number, uh, I don't see it right off hand in here. Uh, at, at any rate, it was dust off 228. Um, Mr. Hibbard was a pilot. I was his co-pilot on this particular mission. Uh, our passengers were a, uh, R. Young of the Arkansas National Guard and an M. Harari who represented interests of, the, of Panama and was uh, referred to as Ambassador Harari. M. Harari was actually Mike Harari, a Mossad agent. During the flight, uh, I had installed a recorder, a cassette tape recorder that recorded all conversations on board the aircraft. We did uh, activate that recorder during the flight. Uh, the p personnel in the back of the aircraft talking on our private intercom uh, did not know that what they were saying was not private. In the conversation between Mr. Harari and Mr. Young, uh, Mr. Young was asking Mr. Harari basically uh, what's going on here. Uh, but he says, Arkansas has the capability to manufacture anything in the area of weapons, and if we don't have it, we'll get it. 
Harari said in return, how about government controls? Well, Young then came in and said, the governor's on top of it, and if the feds get nosy, we hear about it and make a call. Then they're called off. He was looking around the countryside and continued, why the hell would anyone fight for a shithole like this? Harari referred, shaking his head in awe, what we do has nothing to do with preserving a country's integrity. It's just business. And third world countries see their destiny as defeating borders and expanding. The more of this mentality we can produce, the greater our wealth. We train and we arm. That's our job. And in return, we get a product, far more value than money, for a gun. We're paid with the product. And we credit top dollar for the product. Still looking confused, buddy. Buddy was still looking confused, and Mike continued. Look, one gun and 3,000 rounds of ammo is $1,200. A kilo of product is about $1,000. We credit the Contras $1,500 for every kilo. That's top dollar for a kilo of cocaine down here. It's equivalent to the American's Kmart special, buy four, get one free. On our side, we spend $1,200 for a kilo and sell it for $12,000 to $15,000. Now that's a profit center. And the market is much greater for the product and for the weapons. It's just good business sense, understand? Buddy responded with damn. So you guys promote wars and revolution to provide weapons for drugs. We provide the non-numbered parts to change out, and we all win. Damn, that's good. Harari, the Mossad agent, said in return, it's good when it works, but someone, how is, how, is, how do you say, uh, has his hand in the coffer? Buddy responding on the defenses. Defensive. Well, we get our 10% right off the top, and that's plenty. Goofus can make it go a long way. Harari responded to that. Who is Goofus? Governor Clinton. That's our pet word for him. You know, they call the president POTUS for president of the United States. Well, we call Clinton Goofus for governor of the United States. He thinks he is, anyhow. That's your problem in America, Harari responded. You have no respect for your elected officials. They're more powerful than you think and have ears everywhere. You should heed my words and be loyal to your leaders, especially when speaking to persons like me. Your remarks indicate a weakness, something our intelligence analysts look for. Ah, uh, hell, Mike, everybody knows that Clinton's, Clinton wants that White House and will do anything to get it. That's why I'm here instead of someone else. We know about the cocaine. Hell, I've picked it up before with Lassiter when he was worried about going on to Little Rock Air Base to get it. A new line of conversation ensued, uh, and in this line of conversation, Clinton uh, Young said this, answering uh, Harari's question about uh, what's going on in Arkansas. Clinton thinks he's in charge, but he'll only go as far as Casey allows. Me and my staff, we keep the lid on things. You know, complaints about night flying Arkansas people are private folks. They don't like a lot of commotion, and MENA just isn't the right place for the operation. It keeps us busy at the shredder, if you know what I mean. Dan the man, speaking of Lassiter, he does magic with the money. Between him and Jack Stevens, we don't have to worry about, a bit about it. Then we got Parks. If there's any problem, he's the man. Finnis oversees our drop zone. Nash, he's just like the boss. Boss's yes man. Personally, I think he's a mistake. And in finishing their conversation, uh, he spoke of a man named Barry Seal. Uh, Buddy Young said, Seal and his guys, I like his attitude, and leave the driving to us, he said, quoting one of Seal's good old boys, saying, you like Seal? Mike asked. Buddy re returned with, hell, he's the only one I trust. Respect is the word. Do you see much of him, Harari asked? Hell yeah, we test drive Clinton's rides before we send him on, you know? He laughed, grinding his hips, saying how much saying, how much coke do you reckon you can make in a week? Harari responded with, one camp can produce 400 keys a week. The others are about half that. But that's just our operation here. We have other sources in various parts of the world. Why do you ask? What? Oh, the governor wanted to know our capacity. Mike, who else is on the team? Well, hell, I forget who I told you about. Harari ran down the list from his memory. And then Young continued, oh, there's a manufacturer, these two and the tape stopped at that point. That's a taped conversation between Mike Harari and Buddy Young. Buddy Young was the security chief for Governor Clinton of Arkansas. Okay, what are we looking at? This is a Department of Defense International flight plan filed on the 30th of March 1985 with 
operations at Pomerola Air Base. The flight was actually a day flight into La Mesa and then on into Tela, Honduras. Uh, we were delivering some people in for an overnight stay. Uh, that night I was tasked by Wally World, the intelligence arm of Pomerola Air Base, to pick up several passengers. Uh, these are the notes from those passengers that I picked up and flew that night under night vision goggle flight. I flew a man named North, a na man named Rodriguez, a man named Dr. Gus, who was actual General Alvarez, and a man named Ami Nir, who was a, the, uh, the um, counterterrorism uh, counselor to uh, Shimon Perez of Israel. Uh, I flew them into Rus Rus, a camp outside of the main camp um, where a cocaine kitchen was operating by the Contras. Uh, we then went to Santa Ana, another cocaine kitchen in operation by the Contras. Uh, North said the following, Vice President Bush was going to take care of Seal and Noriega. They spoke about the meeting in Costa Rica six days prior, said uh, Barr had spoken to Bush via SATCOM. The Vice President ordered that Seal and Noriega be taken out. When Barr handed me the phone, Vice President Bush seemed very agitated. He wanted uh, the serial number of Seal's aircraft. He said if we needed, uh, if we needed to, we may have to take extreme measures. He told me that these men were out of control. This shouldn't be happening, he said. Do you understand? I, I, I told him that I did, but I, I really didn't at that point. Uh, this shouldn't be happening, he, he had repeated. Now it's going into perspective. He wants to hit on Seal and Noriega. It would be pretty easy. A cooler Mark Med supply is on Seal's plane, but one like, but one like we had put on Torrio's aircraft. One in Noriega's plane, too. That would take care of the problem. Barr said he'd take care of it, though. I wonder what he'll do. These were my notes uh, on the 30th of March, 1985. I believe today we know exactly what he did to take care of Mr. Seal and Mr. Noriega. Uh, initial, initial conversations in that camp indicated that uh, from Mr. North that uh, Jeb would take care of it with his friends in Colombia. Uh, I believe in 1986, Barry Seal was assassinated by three Colombians. The documents you've viewed are contained in the Tatum Chronicles. The Tatum Chronicles are available by calling 1-800-201-7892, extension 58. That's 800-201-7892, extension 58. On the 19th of April, in La Mesa, Honduras, I was in the back of a CH-47 Chinook helicopter from the 159th Aviation Company and based out of Fort Campbell, Kentucky. They were a supporting element for Task Force 160. I had been tasked by Wally World to deliver some maps to them uh, so that they had terrain maps to get into Roos Roos, the area that we just talked to, talked about with the cocaine kitchens. Um, while taxiing in the aircraft, in the rear of the aircraft, uh, the aircraft's main rotor blades meshed together. Uh, the aircraft sub subsequently came apart in flight. Uh, fortunately, we were at a hover. Uh, injuries sustained, no one died in the crash. Several of us uh, sustained uh, back and neck injuries. I received injuries which ended up uh, causing compression fractures in two places in my back. Uh, this preclu precluded me from flight duties for at least a year. Uh, however, because of the problems that resulted in working uh, for the National Security Council, for the military, and for the CIA, who were all three my bosses in Honduras, uh, we found that it was necessary, necessary for me to leave the uh, restricting environment of the military. There were too many questions asked, uh, as you'll see in the Tatum Chronicles. Um, there are documents in there that talk about uh, medevac flights being made and commanded by other than medevac assets. These were military messages being passed back and forth between Special Operations Command, uh, Readiness Command, and other commands which were involved in the area of operations. So in April of 1986, I was recruited into and accepted uh, the job of working for what's, what is called today an operational subgroup. 
OSGs in 1986 were formed by authorization of the TWIG, which is the Terrorist Incident Working Group. In turn, the Terrorist Incident Working Group was authorized to be formed by the uh, Special Situation Group, which was authorized by President Reagan in 1982. The Special situ Situation Group is a group uh, which is chaired by uh, our command elements of um, national security, defense intelligence, CIA, military intelligence, uh, and, and other assets of the federal government to include certain cabinets. Um, this particular uh, special situation group chairs only uh, in the event of, an, of a national security problem. There is a standing group which was formed to support the net, this special situation group called TWIG, the Terrorist Incident Working Group. This standing group uh, was our command element for the operational subgroups. Under the National Security Decision Directive in 1986, uh, we were allowed to employ the assets of civilian and foreign personnel uh, to work with us in the OSGs. As an officer in the OSG, I was primarily tasked to the neutralization section. Uh, neutralization section deals in aligning uh, foreign nationals uh, with the interests of the United States government. Let me give you an example. If you all recall during the Nicaraguan rebellion, uh, all we wanted Nicaragua to do, the Ortega regime, was to hold free elections. That's the whole purpose, supposedly, of the rebellion that we funded, of the Contras uh, going into uh, rebellious war with the Sandinista government. Uh, that was not accomplished. In 1989, uh, it was decided that we can't go, we'll never win this way. It's a guerrilla war. We all know where guerrilla wars end up. We were in Vietnam in a guerrilla war forever. And that was, it wasn't functioning properly. It wasn't coming into a line. The alignment wasn't being done. Uh, it wasn't being accomplished. So it was decided that uh, the OSG neutralization section would neutralize Mr. Ortega into alignment. To neutralize a person, we could do one of three things. We could uh, intimidate them into it, we could coerce them into it, or we could take them out and prepare the next guy uh, to align with the, our needs. Uh, Mr. Ortega, after being uh, visited by an emissary of the United States on several occasions, refused to hold free elections. We decided at that point uh, the refusal was unacceptable. We then sent uh, an OSG member to him. That OSG member explained to Mr. Ortega that you have two weeks to announce free elections. If you don't in two weeks, we gave him the name of the man who was a very good friend of his and a second cousin that would be terminated, regardless of what you put around him. And we challenged him at that time, put a battalion of your best soldiers around that man. He's still gonna die if you don't hold free elections. Two weeks later, his cousin died by missile fire. Within two weeks, Mr. Ortega announced the free elections for Nicaragua. The neutralization. As I say, uh, neutralization in that particular instance took form of a termination, which, which was actually uh, a co form of co coercion, you know, uh, coercion or intimidation to align him. Uh, that's happened around the world. Uh, it, in that particular instance, uh, I have to say that I believe that that was in the interest of the United States. And let me tell you why. Uh, when we put defense satellites into orbit, uh, the telemetry for many of our satellites didn't come out where we wanted the, them to come out. It came out in a little Central American country. Uh, we have a place called a, ta a tactical site in Honduras, which needed to be protected at the time because the telemetry of these defense satellites and intelligence satellites all came together there. We needed to protect the borders and having instability there with all of this data and information flowing right into that uh, area was imperative to national security. As the OSGs grew, so did our taskings. Uh, not only did they grow, but they changed. Uh, 
instead of working directly for the United States and in the interest of the United States, we found that the operational subgroups were used on an international basis to provide alignment for other countries, allies. We found that the primary countries that we were supporting were the G7 group of companies that all, all of you are aware of. Um, and today it's the G7 plus one. I think we've included Russia in that just recently. Um, any ranking official of these G7 countries could uh, ask for tasking from us. Uh, we would recognize that tasking, we would evaluate the tasking, and we would, we would provide support for that tasking, if not uh, direct, indirect support for that tasking. Uh, however, any neutralizations that were performed through our section uh, had to be performed by order of a U.S. official. That usually required, uh, if it, in, if it uh, included intimidation or co coercion, um, it was simply required by uh, a ranking member of our National Security Council. If it went beyond that, it required the uh, signature and authorization of the Executive Office of the United States. This is an example of a document which required the termination of a target for the OSGs. It was signed in 1991 by, by then President George Bush. I'll read this to you so that you understand what it says. It was an activation order activating myself, DG Chip Tatum, codenamed Pegasus. You are hereby ordered into service of the United States government. It has been determined that, and then the name of the target is blacked out, and his nationality is blacked out has illegally obtained documents which are a vital concern to the security of the United States and selected allies of the United States. It has therefore been determined by finding of the National Security Council that these documents must be recovered. Due to this determination, you are authorized to use whatever means necessary to recover said documents and ensure that this criminal is brought to justice. You are authorized to exceed ex existing regulations and FTMs to accomplish this mission. If loss of life occurs as a result of the performance of your duties, you shall be exempt and protected from prosecution. Can you explain what's going on there? Sure. Uh, this particular person uh, had some documents in his possession that could implicate uh, some of the leaders of this country in illegal activities. That's what it came down to. Uh, I won't name the name because I don't want to uh, endanger my family from his family. Uh, for in, in any retribution. Uh, to say that we, we can exceed existing field training manuals and existing regulations simply means that uh, we can shoot to kill. Uh, if I do this, decide that I need to shoot to kill, uh, the last paragraph that states that you shall be exempt from prosecution uh, and means that the United States will exempt me from prosecution under Rule 12.3 of the Federal Code and uh, protected from prosecution uh, implies that uh, the world courts or other countries, uh, I will be protected from them for, if they decide to try to prosecute. Okay. Uh, why are you releasing this document now? Why is it coming out? I think that the American people need to know the level uh, of what they're dealing with. I think they need to know uh, exactly what to expect. This termination order, uh, because it involved a foreign national, I accepted. Uh, if it were for an American national, I would not accept, but there are those in the OSGs that would accept that, and let me explain to you why. Uh, OSG members aren't necessarily United States government personnel. We had intelligence officers from Danish intelligence, Turkish intelligence, the Mossad, um, British intelligence and other countries. Uh, for $25,000 to $50,000 permission, you can bet that they'll terminate or they'll neutralize whoever they're ordered to do. So as you've just seen in the document that you've just viewed, the OSGs were tasked with neutralizations around the world. Uh, who we neutralized became more and more bizarre as time went on. And I think it's important for you to understand uh, a modus operandi, an MO that I started noticing with Mr. Bush. When he ran for president uh, in 1988, we received an order to neutralize, now this doesn't mean to assassinate, but to neutralize one person who was gaining favor 
in the voters' eyes. That man is Gary Hart. Uh, because it was an American citizen, I refused to do it. However, there were others who did not refuse to do that. And now, as a matter of history, we all know what happened to Mr. Gary Hart. Uh, he was effectively neutralized uh, by, by the OSG providing a woman uh, and taping that uh, rendezvous. It was then given to the media and pushed, pushed in the media. Had that happened today, uh, the morality of America has changed to the point that I don't think anything uh, would be done about it. But then it was still a vital issue to America. That's my opinion. <laughs> it may not, you may not agree with that, but it's an opinion that's bolstered by an election that just happened. Uh, the next instance that I was tasked uh, to neutralize an American citizen was in the 1992 election. Uh, I was asked to neutralize a, a candidate uh, for a third party. Uh, th this candidate was gaining favor in the voters' eyes. He was growing fast, and he's a person most of us know. His name is Atros Perot. I these young people can cause the American people to regain confidence in their government overnight if they would put this in place, right? I was told to neutralize Perot in a meeting uh, in 19, early 1992, uh, 1991, and I refused to do that. I told them at that time that I would not, and I'm tired of it, and I gave them a copy of a tape of uh, documents that we had made through the years. When I say we, it's myself and several other intelligence officers. We call this our insurance policy. Uh, those documents were given to uh, my handler at the time. Uh, he was instructed to pass it on to Mr. Bush, uh, who had given the order for Mr. Perot's neutralization. No, I don't think so. Uh, had I been tasked with it, I simply would have intimidated him uh, into not running uh, for office. And I, I believe, historically, if we're looking at what happened, that intimidation did take place. Uh, I did cause word to be given to him uh, during that election that uh, there was going to be a neutralization attempted and that he needed to be aware of it. He announced, I believe, uh, early in the running that uh, there was threats of blackmail made against him, something to do with his daughter, and he decided to drop out of the running. Uh, but then in, uh, I believe, August or September of the um, election year, uh, he jumped back into the running. I had told a good friend who uh, had, was working out of uh, Tampa, Florida for the government, uh, and I, it is my information from him that uh, it was at Saddlebrook uh, Resort in Tampa, Florida, that Mr. Perot was told of the uh, neutralization order. And this information came from you? This information did come from me to this uh, federal officer. As I reflect back now and think about my many years of intelligence service and the things that I had done, uh, the missions that I had been given, and in later years working for the OSGs, uh, I can see a very common thread. And it's a thread, and I'm not easily uh, threatened, but it's a thread uh, tied to a particular word. And that particular word has cropped up more and more in the most recent past by uh, politicians. Uh, there was a politician, a, a senator, uh, that was interviewing the new, CIA, new director of the CIA, uh, George Tennant, uh, and she asked him a specific question, and that was just early this year. She asked Mr. Tennant, 
Are you prepared to usher in the new millennium? And are you prepared to build your central intelligence agency to see to the new world order? That was a damning statement. Because I'd heard that statement in other instances. I heard that statement from statements and words pertaining to the new world order from my handlers, uh, from George Bush, uh, from Bill Colby, and from Mr. Casey. George Bush was one of the highest up that I'm aware of, if not the highest up that I was ever exposed to during the course of my White House Pentagon level mind control victimiz victimization. George Bush began with the United Nations. He went on to head our CIA. And then by everything that I witnessed and experienced, it was George Bush who was in control of our country through three administrations because Ronald Reagan answers to George Bush. Then George Bush was in office himself. And after that, Bill Clinton went into office. And I heard Bill Clinton and George Bush once discussing the, how when the American populace became disillusioned with Republicans in, in control of our country bringing us into the new world order, that Bill Clinton as a Democrat would be put into office. And it was also my experience to have witnessed Bill Clinton answering to George Bush. So we certainly aren't um, blaming everything sure. on George Bush. There's a lot of other players that are named in our book, Transformation of America. But it's very important that people understand who's at the top of this effort so that they know exactly what the problem really is. Now, let me define how anti-government I am not. Because I am not anti-U.S. Constitution. How many of you are totally for our U.S. Constitution? How many of you are totally against those who are trying to do away with our Constitution? How many of you did time in the military, or maybe you're an ex-policeman like me, and have sworn to uphold the Constitution against all enemies over there and over here, foreign and domestic? Okay, I have twice. And uh, I was born in a conservative American family, and my dad was a conservative, and so I guess I'm now a, an extremist. Why? Because they want to discredit everybody who doesn't want wor world government. Everyone who won't buy the party line is now an extremist, you see. So we can be labeled, and most of the people who don't know what is going on will buy the lie and turn against those who really know what's going on and who can educate others and help them stop it, perhaps. Now, uh, I can see that everything we were doing from 1986 in the OSGs uh, until I left in 1982, we're de we're, 1992, we're, we're designed to uh, align countries into a one world government. There's no doubt in my mind that that's what we were doing. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that that timetable by the end of 2000 will be accomplished. As a matter of fact, having seen certain time schedules uh, for things to happen, not understanding what it was designed for, I can say that they're ahead of schedule right now. It's our job to deter that, to slow that down, and perhaps by slowing that down, uh, by slowing it down at the very top levels of uh, these group of elite, perhaps we can give us common people uh, the opportunity to come together and decide that there's something better than what they have planned for us in the new world order. Well, I don't think that we have faced as critical a moment in American history since this republic began. And I say that advisedly. You look back over the course of our history, we've had a lot of crises. The great crisis of the revolution and the civil war and the depression and the world wars we've been through an awful lot. But our founders predicted time and again that if the final threat ever came to the freedom of America, it would not be because of some external foe or invasion. It would be because somewhere along the way, we lost the will, we lost the character, we lost the wherewithal to govern ourselves and retain our freedom. And I think you can see all around you in America today that there are signs that that crisis is upon us. 
a government that I, over the decades on the claim of war and the claims of peace and the claims of, of every kind of crisis they can find has expanded its bureaucratic control, its control over our resources, its control through regulation over every aspect of our lives. Some people have come along who seem to believe that it is the business of government to substitute for the work and the will and the energy and the responsibility of this great people. But you know, that's not how this country was built. It's not how we got here. It is not how we sustained its liberty during the 19th century or moved it to a position of world leadership in the 20th century. I do not believe that the challenge of politics in America is about the confidence we can have in our rulers. I believe it is about the confidence we must have in ourselves. And if we are willing once again, if we are willing once again to assert that true confidence, then I think that we can put this country back on its path toward glory. Pyramids. At the peak of the pyramid, you've got a tiny, tiny few people who know everything there is to know about that organization. They know its real agenda, its real motivation, where it's really seeking to go. The further you come down from that pyramid peak in any organization, you're meeting more and more and more people who know less and less and less about what that organization's agenda really is. They only know their part in it. They call it compartmentalization. I always also call it the mushroom approach. Keep them in the dark and feed them bullshit. Through this pyramid system, well into the 90% of people who are daily in their jobs in this city and other cities around the world, who are daily pushing this world towards more and more centralization of power on a global level, either don't realize they're doing it because they don't see the big pattern or they don't realize the implications of what they're doing. And all these aspects of life, the banking system is a pyramid. So is the media. So is the, free, the uh, secret society network of the world. So is the multinational corporation network. And at the peak of their pyramids, they fuse into one global pyramid peak, where a tiny few people, maybe no more than 13 families, pervade down the pyramid an all-encompassing policy which pushes us daily towards more and more centralization of power. But you know, if you look at the pyramid, where is the power in the pyramid? We've been conned and conditioned and programmed to believe that it's up there. It is not. That's up there because the rest of the pyramid, us, are holding it up there and that's the only reason it exists. And that leads me to something else as I start to draw to a close here. And that is it's okay standing at microphones like this and meetings like this and saying it's them, it's them, it's them. No, it's only possible this manipulation because human race of the world, it is us, us, us that allow it to happen. I think to perform effectively as a new world order, uh, you have to have a commonality of countries. Uh, you can't have the separation of countries, the distinct separation that we have now. You know, you look at uh, Ireland, uh, who is uh, a fairly poor country. Uh, they don't have all of the um, conveniences that we do in America today. Uh, so I think conveniences will be lost uh, in some countries and conveniences will be gained in others. Uh, the two-car system in America, the heavy use of fuel in the United States. I don't think that we'll be successful in a, in a one-world government uh, with obtaining the fuels to sustain that. I think that there's going to have to be a change, and I think that the government uh, is seeing to that change on a very, very slow, but very, very precise schedule. I think that uh, the way that they will do this is they will slowly, and very slowly, but very precisely, enact little pieces of legislation, sometimes on an international basis under environmental laws, uh, sometimes under uh, state legislation, sometimes under federal legislation. But I think you'll see these little tags that are put on legislation will affect us for the rest of our lives. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me make a long story short. I think in reference to the subject of wetlands, drugs, 
guns, the environment, the FAA, FCC, atomic energy, which we haven't discussed, a variety of other matters. Uncle Sam being an international power and having the authority to ratify and adopt treaties has done so regarding these various subject matters. And when, in reference to some of these laws, that happens, it is quite often that Uncle Sam will come along and make a crime. You know, there are cases out there that have never been reversed where the United States Supreme Court says, gee, Congress does not possess the police power. If it doesn't have the police power, why are we having police powers being exercised? You can bet your bottom dollar that constitutionally, a lot of these crimes could fit where? Within the Constitution. Offenses against the laws of nations. Well, in working for the people I work for, I only see two classes. I see the, the leaders who are the elite, uh, and I say the leaders who are the elite because of the people that we worked for. Uh, we worked for um, the Rothschilds, the Roosevelts, uh, the, the superpowers in, in money around the world. Uh, there was never any question of finances on anything that we did. If I needed $250,000 for a mission, I had a line, of signature line of credit. I walked into a bank in New York, I signed a signature, signed my signature, pulled out $250,000 cash, walked away, and that money was replaced the following week. It was that easy for me. So in, in, in answer, I hope that I've answered that in saying there's two groups. There's the citizens and there's the elite, and that's all there are. Uh, those around the world that think that there's going to be an upper class or that there's going to be comfort like there was, there won't be. Uh, myself, I see even maybe a third class, but that third class won't be considered citizenry uh, on, the, on the New World Order. It'll be considered uh, enemies of the New World Order who are uh, possibly living in, uh, in state of an underground. I think in summing up what I'd like to say uh, to all of, all of you who listen to this video uh, and in the media, I'd like to ask one question. Is anybody there?
out again My dreams would come true We'd take it all back from you If my dreams could come true We'd tear it down and start again Bless America.